pretty much every drug available in psychiatry, let's focus in psychiatry just for the moment, um, was developed before these technologies existed. And we don't really know how they work in the brain. I'm uh, Professor Mittal Mesa. I'm Professor of Neuroimaging and Psychopharmacology here at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience in King's College London. That's half the interview over, just saying where I work. <laughs> Hello Mittal and thanks very much for talking to us today. Why don't we start with you telling us how you study the brain? We mainly use MRI brain scanning methods and we use that to study the drug effects in brain mainly. We're very interested in how we look at the brain. MRI is relatively young in science so just as you start to get to grips with things you know new technology comes along which is fantastic. And why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this to try and see if we can understand, you know, at a neuroscientific level, how these drugs function. But one of the main reasons we're doing it is because we like to be contributing to the development of better treatments for people with um, disorders um, within psychiatry and within neurology. So you're saying you're looking at how drugs work on the brain, but if we're, we're already using these drugs to treat people with various mental illnesses, don't we already understand how they work? Pretty much every drug available in psychiatry, let's focus in psychiatry just for the moment, um, was developed before these technologies existed. So they were developed and we don't really know how they work in the brain. We might know how they work at a molecular level. We might know it hits a particular receptor site in the brain. We might know some work regarding how they function in the brain in rodents but we, might, we know very little in humans. They're all developed pretty much before these techniques were available. So there's an awful lot we can learn about how existing treatments operate. And we can use that knowledge to help guide us in developing new treatments as well. But it's not just existing psychiatric drugs that you study, is it? You're also trying to help develop new and better ones? There's a huge unmet need in the treatment of psychiatric disorders. And so there is plenty of scope for developing better treatments, okay? Um, patients want better treatments. For example, we might be interested in a, a potential new treatment which might impact the reward system in the brain. You might have um, a symptom of low motivation. You have low motivation in schizophrenia, you have low motivation in depression. You can also have low motivation um, it, for other reasons, for example, after a traumatic brain injury as well. So uh, one of the questions is, is that low motivation, is that, is that mediated by the same circuits in the brain? And if it is, then maybe it might be responsive to the same or similar treatments as well. So there might be benefits in looking at symptoms and how to understand particular symptoms better and then how to treat those symptoms better, because you might benefit more than one diagnosis. That seems quite surprising to me that you're looking at um, rather than specific psychiatric illnesses that fit our current labelling system you're, you're almost looking at things that run deeper below them. Yeah for sure I mean this is I think this is the way to go because you know psychi psychiatric diagnosis is clinically useful but they're not based on a neurobiology they're not based on a functional understanding of the brain so if we're going to base new treatment development on a neurobiological understanding of the brain, we want to look at processes and symptoms, and they may cross diagnostic boundaries. We are, are very interested in psychiatric symptoms that occur in neurological disorders. So for example, Parkinson's disease, which is a movement disorder, really characterised by people experiencing a tremor and a shuffling gait and real difficulty in their motor systems and movement symptoms are not the only symptoms. Patients with Parkinson's disease have many other symptoms. We just generally categorise them as non-motor symptoms and there's one symptom that up to half of patients experience which is psychosis. So patients with Parkinson's disease will often experience hallucinations. Okay? And that might develop into experiencing delusions. So um, one of the models that we were, we've been working with is using uh, psychedelic drugs. Okay. Now, why we use psychedelic drugs? Well, drugs like psilocybin, 
they hit a particular receptor in the brain called the 5-HT2A receptor. Sil sorry, psilocybin, isn't that the oh, yeah. compound that's in magic mushrooms? Yeah, that's, that's the active compound in, in magic mushrooms. So psilocybin is turned into psilocin in the brain, and that hits a receptor called the 5-HT2A receptor, and we think that is instrumental in its psychedelic effects. Now, one of the features of psychedelic effects are visual distortions and visual hallucinations, having particular visual experiences which you don't normally have. What's interesting is that when you study individuals with Parkinson's disease psychosis, you find an elevation in the number of 5-HT2A receptors. Uh -huh. And while we can see that in different areas of the brain, it's, it's um, very much uh, located in what we call the ventral stream, which is a visual processing pathway in the brain. We um, came across a drug and we s tried to see if it reduced the effect of psilocybin. And it did reduce the, the impact of the psychedelic experience as well. Um, so that's very promising. And so then we thought, well, if it's reducing the impact of the psychedelic experience, that suggests it's getting in the brain with sufficient success to actually have an effect on the brain physiology. So now we can go into the scanner in patients with Parkinson's disease psychosis. We don't need to worry about psilocybin anymore because these people are already experiencing hallucinations. And now we're running a study where they're given this drug for a couple of weeks. And at the end of those two weeks, we put them in the scanner to see if the activity in this visual processing pathway has been normalized by this compound as well. What made you work with psychoactive, you know, recreational drugs? Is that, is that a useful place to shed light on how the brain works? The solutions for new treatments uh, may not always come from where we expect them to come from. Recreational drugs, we also know they get in the brain and they might have beneficial effects in the brain as well. So just because they happen to be used as recreational drugs doesn't mean that those, those compounds might not also be useful. We already know that opiates, which are used recreationally, are incredibly useful to medicine. In fact, they're so useful to medicine that they're a critical medication in pain relief, um, in surgery, in anaesthesia. And you've studied ketamine quite a lot yourself, haven't you? Yeah, yeah we've studied yeah. ketamine a lot. So ketamine is very interesting at the moment because it appears to be uh, proving successful as an antidepressant, particularly in people where other existing treatments just haven't worked. But ketamine is also interesting because it produces a set of experiences which for a long time we thought looked a bit like psychosis, one of the main symptoms you have in schizophrenia. So you can give otherwise healthy people ketamine, you can put them in the scanner and you can give them other drugs on top of it and see if it reverses the effect of ketamine. You can find out first of all if it works, if it gets in the brain sufficiently to reverse the effect of ketamine and you can find out which dose is most successful. And then you can go in to test patients with real confidence because if you, can re if you can't reverse the effects of ketamine, then you're probably not hitting the glutamate system enough to be beneficial to patients. So uh, do you think that um, if you do end up helping successfully develop new drugs for um, perhaps, say, to increase motivation or to increase memory, as you talked about, could they ever be used also just for enhancement in healthy people? You know, a lot of people take a lot of drugs recreationally. So methylphenidate is a good example of a, a drug that is used as a treatment. It's used as a treatment in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and it's used as a treatment in some sleep disorders as well. It's a psychomotor stimulant drug. It boosts the chemicals noradrenaline and dopamine in the brain. Is this the drug that's also known as Ritalin? Yeah, yeah, its trade name is Ritalin. And, um, you know, people use stimulants like Ritalin. So there will be um, areas of use, maybe, that people find these novel drugs might be beneficial with, just like they have with methylphenidate or other compounds as well. But we would not be looking to develop drugs for recreational use. We'll be looking to develop drugs to treat particular impairments. And suggestibility is a very interesting thing to look at in the brain yeah. scanner as well. Isn't that something you do a lot of? So uh, we use um, hypnosis and targeted suggestions in some of our research. And you know, I got into this because we've been studying drugs for a long time, where we have an individual in one particular state, whether on a placebo, for example, and then we put them in another state, 
for example, on a drug, and we compare them to see what the effect was. And actually, we can use exactly the same experimental paradigms to look at other phenomena, like hypnosis and suggestion, where we'd have someone in their regular state and post-suggestion as well, and we can look at the brain systems and how they change as well. So we can use the same experimental methodology. So does this help explain what hypnosis is, what goes on in the brain when somebody is hypnotised? Yeah, so we can use these methods. We've put people in the scanner and we've hypnotised them as well, so we can look at the brain systems involved in hypnosis. So we can, first of all, we can look at the brain systems and how they differ in those who are more suggestible for hypnosis and less suggestible. And can I just ask what that means to the average person? Say if I were someone who was suggestible, not going to a hypnotist, but just in my everyday life, yeah. how would I know? Oh, you probably wouldn't know in everyday life. The way we do it in the laboratory, it's a bit boring in the laboratory, um, hypnosis, it's a bit dry. We might have a very simple suggestion that someone is very relaxed and their eyes are closing and they're feeling heavy. It might take five or ten minutes to get through that, but a lot of people will close their eyes and you ask them afterwards, they said, yeah, I closed my eyes. I know I could have opened them, but I just didn't feel like it. Okay? And it can be as subtle as that, a suggestion. And we can go into more complex suggestions where you might feel like you can't lift your arm up or you can hear something in the room that isn't really there, a more cognitive suggestion. So one of the first things that people started to do, and we also did, was to suggest paralysis. So we would suggest to people that their left arm cannot move and it's paralysed, okay? And we might ask them to try and move a joystick whilst they're lying in the scanner. And then we can look um, at their behaviour and they weren't moving the joystick, fine. Maybe they're being very compliant, maybe these are the best volunteers in the world and they're behaving exactly as we ask them to do. Or maybe they genuinely are experiencing a paralysis. Maybe they really want to move, but somehow their arm is not moving. That's what they describe to us, okay? And we can believe them, but that can only take us so far. If we can look in the brain, then that will tell us what's happening in the brain during that experience. And we can compare that to what's happening in the brain when we ask them to simulate not being able to move their hand or pretend. Okay. And does it look different and in the brain? And it's different, it's completely different. And what you find is a down-regulation in some of the areas involved in motor planning. So this is, this is amazing, really. So this tells us that actually, through hypnosis and this suggestion, we're actually down-regulating parts of the motor network. And so this experience that people are describing is matched by what we're seeing in the brain. But can that really explain why, say, somebody on a hypnotist stage show might just start pretending to speak a foreign language or doing something really silly and maybe humiliating? Stage hypnosis is something slightly different to what we're doing in the laboratory. What may be happening is that the stage hypnotist will, might be doing a screening of individuals, somehow cleverly picking out those that are highly suggestible. They might be very skilled at this and then actually invoking what we call targeted suggestions for entertainment. Now, targeted suggestions are, are very useful experimentally. So we can um, give people particular suggestions so we can study certain experiences in isolation of another disorder, for example, or an illness. We can tell people that the thoughts that they're having, the words they're choosing, are not their own words, but they're someone else's words. Uh, that they're writing down and they do claim to have less control over the words they're selecting and they feel like someone else is giving them the words to write down and then we see changes in the language areas in the brain during those experiences as well. And isn't that um, a symptom that's sometimes seen in schizophrenia too? Yeah, so passivity phenomena is what we call this um, and that's a very common symptom in schizophrenia and so this is really an opportunity to study these phenomena in isolation. So they tell us a few really important things. First of all, they tell us that otherwise healthy people who are highly suggestible can experience passivity phenomena. They can experience this ailing control of movement, these thought insertion experiences. So we can study the brain areas involved and they're not areas that are generally involved in having the diagnosis of schizophrenia, but they're areas involved in that particular symptom. So do you hope to one day be able to help develop uh, drugs to 
to cancel out those symptoms? Yeah, so we already are looking at some of these um, symptoms and how drugs might modulate some of these symptoms. And I think with this better understanding, we can start to think about better ways to use existing drugs, but also understand how we can assess novel drugs by having these techniques uh, with the neuroimaging, with cognitive testing, with assays, with drug models, we can start to develop um, the techniques to look at novel drugs and novel treatments so we can accelerate their development. Thank you very much for telling us all about it today. Thank you for having me.